into this hour of worship of the living God on this fourth Sunday in the season of Lent. Let us enter the house of the Lord with music and with song, and let us worship God. Be still and know that I am 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 God. Let us pray. God of our journey toward wholeness, as we enter this second half of the season of Lent, bless us with endurance, with patience, with resolve. You call us to be a people set apart in this world for goodness, to be reconcilers and healers. In this pandemic season, we are all tested, O oh God. Equip us to be those who, by the strength of our faith, can encourage others and work for their wholeness in all circumstances. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Numbers, reading in chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. As we prepare to hear this word, let us pray. Your word is a lamp unto our feet, guiding our steps. Open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to receive your word, and hearing to seek to do as you call us to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, 
and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from among us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The people grew impatient along the way. Does not this ancient verse from the book of Numbers sound remarkably contemporary to us? The people grew impatient along the way. There are signs that we're entering the home stretch of our coronavirus pandemic. As Washington's governor has set us all to move to phase three of our reopening plans. As our president has announced that immunizations, uh, that the vaccination will be available to everyone beginning May 1st, it feels as though we are entering a new phase of our journey. And so it seems to me if we are on the home stretch, or if it feels that way, that this is the time especially for us to be mindful, not to grow impatient along the way. There is a significant way that the ancient Israelites and we are similar in our situation. They understood themselves to be called by God to be a holy people. In fact, the book of Numbers focuses singularly on the challenges of this calling to be holy. It is a rigorous instruction in the kind of the holiness the Lord is calling upon the people to adopt as they spend 40 years on their journey. Imagine that. We've been one year out they were close to 40 years out as they were uh, approaching the Transjordan and getting very near to the Promised Land. So we and they, called by God to be a holy people. It says this in the first letter of Peter, that we are a holy nation. We need to be careful to understand what holiness means, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But what about the second feature of our reading today? Do we believe in a God who sends serpents among us? As it says in the story that the people's impatience led them to grumble against the Lord and against Moses. They complained about the food and suggested that going back to Egypt might at least provide them a better diet. And this so angered the Lord that it says God sent serpents among them, and many of them died. This doesn't sound like the God we believe in, and I will tell you unequivocally that I see no biblical or theological reason as a Christian to believe that God sent the coronavirus into the world. And again, we'll get to this in just a moment. What are we to do with this strange disconnect between the God of grace in whom we believe, a loving God, and this detail of God sending deadly serpents among the people. Let's begin with this idea of being called to be holy. These days, that feels like a rather self-righteous thing to claim. We Christians are called to be holy, a holy nation. Well, let's understand a couple of things. First, I've long emphasized that to be a Christian is to understand oneself as playing a team sport, not an individual event. We are the body of Christ in the world. God's calling to us is as a people. This runs very counter with our culture's emphasis on individualism and on freedom. We don't want to be told what to do. God knows, we're seeing that in the headlines. Many don't want to be told what to do and will become even violent if someone insists that they must. But we understand ourselves to be called, that is to be set apart by God, to be holy. And again, this holiness is not above 
but a part. God is reaching into the world, calling to us to become servants of other people's wholeness. You shall love your neighbor as yourself is the preeminent commandment of this. We are to work for the wholeness of others. We are to be the healers and reconcilers in all times, and especially in a time of coronavirus pandemic. And so we should understand ourselves as a people called into covenant by a good God to be reconcilers. Second, and this also runs counter to much of our culture's emphasis, we do believe there are consequences for sin. And for that matter, we do believe there is this power called sin. And before we recoil from that word, I would remind us all that what the word sin is trying to describe as a truth of life that we can't escape is that there is in each of us and all of us a countervailing power to the power of love. There is something destructive in us. There is something rebellious in us that wants not to be a people called to be holy as servants of others' wholeness, but to stand out demanding our own ego's imperatives and to be particular and special. This is the power of sin, to divide and to damage us. And although we don't believe in a God who would send serpents among us, as that ancient story told us, and let's not forget this is a story told almost 3,500 years ago. Jesus, in the same scriptures, would correct this misunderstanding and say, God does not send disease and death and destruction among us to punish us, but God does allow for a world in which sin and death are our companions on the journey. Jesus says that when someone is afflicted, it's not to punish them, but to show the glory of God as those called stand with them and love them and seek their healing in all circumstances. And so we can understand maybe the story told in Numbers this way. God did not send the coronavirus among us. God did not create the pandemic. But we should recognize that like those poisonous serpents, here it is. Here it is. We have to just settle with the truth. We are in the midst of a pandemic. And then we might understand the punishment spoken of in numbers as kind of something that we might call logical consequences. If you don't get vaccinated, if you don't wear a mask, if you don't observe fundamental public health practices, the pandemic will be exacerbated. It will spread. You could get sick needlessly and sicken others needlessly. The logical consequence of selfish and irresponsible behavior is, in fact, in many cases, death. And so we Christians need to understand ourselves as called out by God in the midst of the pandemic to be a people set apart for healing, to work for healing and wholeness for all people, to marshal resources that we can give to people to help them in this time of pandemic. And we need to understand that there are laws at work here. And if we abide by them, including the law of love, we mitigate the harm. But if we rebel, we exacerbate it. And so in this Lenten season, let us claim our calling as a holy people. But let us do so understanding the biblical sense of holiness as not set above more righteous, a better class of people, 
but set apart to be like Jesus in the midst of the people, going to the heart of our brokenness, touching the untouchables, eating with sinners, going to the places of the greatest need that the world is the most ready to turn its back from, the aged, the infirm, the immigrant and the refugee, those whom the cruelty of sin would describe as lesser because of the color of their skin or their gender or their sexual orientation or identity. This is where we belong. This is where holiness is manifest because we go to these places in the name of Jesus as healers and those who bear the love of a healing God. And also in this Lenten season, when we are to focus on the obstacles that damage our relationship with God, let us be honest and eyes open about the reality of sin in us and around us. And let us be vigilant to come before our God confessing our sins. For as we see in that ancient story, God listened when the Israelites repented. God gave them a gracious means. This strange and kind of weird thing that it's hard for us to understand, but that is well attested in the ancient Near East, outside of the Bible and outside of Judaism. The creation of a bronze serpent that's raised up that has power of healing in it. And let's note finally, as I close, what God did not do. When the people repented, they said, take away the serpents from us. Well, aren't we often before God right now saying, make the pandemic go away? God didn't instantly take the serpents away. And God gave the people a vaccination in this strange, foreign, and ancient version of a bronze snake on a pole. Well, we have vaccinations. We have many gifted people among us, many of them working because they understand themselves to be called by Jesus, to use the best of their skills as scientists and as administrators and as those in governance, as leaders, to work for healing. We can't make it go away, but we can make it better for each and for all until our time of journeying through the pandemic comes to its close. May we dedicate ourselves to this holiness. May we abide by the loving law of this God. Amen. Let us pray. Equip us for holiness, not to be a people who stand above or apart and insist on the best for ourselves, but to, a to be a people who understand ourselves equipped to go into the places where we would rather not go for the sake of your healing. And let us be a people who trust in you, loving God, in all circumstances, and thereby endure, so that our faith is shown to be our greatest treasure. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's continue on our Lenten journey. My charge to each of us and all of us is to understand ourselves as a holy nation, the body of Christ, a community of care, and to be brave and to be there for each other when bravery falters. In the name of the God who has given us our life, in the name of the Lord Jesus who has redeemed us, in the name of the Holy Spirit who sustains us on this and all journeys. Amen.
Trinity White Plume just turned 13. Like the gardens she has newly learned to plant and tend, she is growing in extraordinary ways. Where Trinity lives on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, which is roughly the size of the state of Connecticut, there is but one grocery store. Moreover, Oglala, Lakota County, where the reservation is located, has the lowest per capita income in the country and consistently ranks as the poorest county in the nation. During the pandemic, what was already a food desert has become even more so, heightening the challenge of food accessibility for Trinity's family and all the families living in Pine Ridge. Thanks to gifts from One Great Hour of Sharing, the garden projects of Owe Aku are making a difference. Owe Aku is a grassroots nonprofit organization that puts people in charge of their own food supply, nutrition, health, and well being by reclaiming ancestral wisdom and teaching Lakota history and culture. The Presbyterian Church USA partners with Oeaku through the Presbyterian Hunger Program, PHP, supported by gifts to One Great Hour of Sharing. For the Lakota, there is a strong spiritual connection between the land and the people. Quote, although traditionally we're not an agrarian people, we have evolved into wanting to preserve the land and preserve the people on the land by beginning our garden project, said Development Director Kent Lebsack. He continued, we thought the best way to do this is with the families and especially young people. And thus was born AMA's Freedom School, which encourages youth to learn not only about growing food but also about the medicinal and ceremonial plants that have been used for generations. Trinity is a young emerging leader with the potential to carry the program forward for many years. She attends and assists with every class and workshop put on by Oayaku. And in turn, she and the other students have begun to teach their families Trinity is also proving herself to be gifted in other areas that benefit the reservation by helping with bookkeeping and other office work. She says, I want to learn my traditions from Amma's Freedom School so that I can keep them alive for future generations. And with our support, we believe that she indeed will continue to grow and make a difference. Gifts to One Great Hour of Sharing help address the root causes of hunger in places around the world, places like the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and others where food security is a serious need. Please give generously, for when we all do a little, it adds up to a lot. Let us pray. God, who plants gardens and tends people, make us gardeners with you and all those who need food. May what we give, what we preserve, and what we grow make lives of nourishment for all. Amen. <laughs>